Whether you call it Kveik, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right. While also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. In order to brew beer, there are a number of necessary steps one must take. For example, mashing the grains and pitching yeast to ferment the wort. While there may be some flexibility in how these steps are performed, they sort of have to happen in order for there to be beer in the end. However, there are another set of things brewers can do that, while not necessarily necessary, are believed to have a positive impact on the finished product. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this episode to discuss the method of adjusting the pH of boiled wort prior to pitching yeast is contributor Jordan Folks. Yeah, this is one of those things that I think that the beginning home brewer would never think to look at. And it's like you have to have a little bit of time with the hobby before you're getting into this level of nuance. But the bigger brewers, they are monitoring pH all along the way. And so uh, I think that this is one of those things that uh, as home brewers like to do is, oh, well, the big boys are doing it. So maybe I should give this a shot. Uh, that is such that is an impetus for so much of what home brewers do. Understandably, I can finally say that I've been brewing for two full decades at this point just a bump over two decades and uh, I've never adjusted the wort <laughs> the pH of my wort post boil uh, but but like you said as you know the first time I heard of this it was from Malcolm Fraser who is a, now a commercial brewer and so I think those home brewers who kind of have their thumb on the pulse of what the commercial brewers are doing uh, and want to emulate that in order you know with the goal rightfully so of producing the highest quality beer possible this is something that they're going to be paying attention to again I've never tried it myself but Jordan you have and I look forward to learning more about about this method from you today. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you're going to receive a reward uh, or rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. I know that right now things are tough. The 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 There's been kind of this ebb and flow uh, happening in the brewing world, not, not as people are many people are homebrewing right now and stuff. So we just want to send a huge thank you out to those of you out there who continue to support us on Patreon. It allows us to do what we're doing this month's guest for uh, the brute for the, uh, Q&A session is Brewlosophy's own Steve Thanos, who in addition to being a contributor here has served on the board of his local homebrew club and is perhaps one of the more creative brewers on the crew in terms of recipe design. If you recall, Steve was also the co-host on our episode about naming beers, which has been one of the most popular in the last year, and he also loves doing some really wonky stuff with his beer. If you want to be a part of this session, you have to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by Friday, June 23rd, 2023, as Steve's going to be taking questions on Saturday. Saturday the 24th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate that as well uh, because it helps those who haven't heard of us yet to more easily find the show. All right. Uh, feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who offer brewers various options for high quality, reasonably priced electric brewing rigs in various voltages and sizes. I've used their 120 volt system for five gallon batches as well as their 240 volt 10 gallon setup. And I'm telling you, these things are awesome. Clawhammer Supply really puts the effort in to ensuring their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible. If you're not ready to make the jump to electric yet, they also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits at great prices. If you've been considering going electric though, you, you owe it to yourself to visit clawhammersupply.com. We're 
confident you're going to love their stuff just as much as we do. Listener and um, contributor Will Lovell <laughs> from San Antonio, Texas, wrote in with feedback on episode 275 where you and I discussed beer glassware, Jordan. Will said, to my knowledge, when you order a Moss beer in Bavaria, you are ordering a liter of beer. Moss refers more to a unit of measure, hence Moss Krug refers to a dimpled glass mug that holds just over a liter. The idea is that the beer goes up to the one liter line mark, which is the line around the top of the glass, and then the extra bit above line is to accommodate for the head on the beer. Hence, there is no smaller Moss Krug beer glass. If you were in Bavaria, you would need to order Einenhalbe, I, I'm I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Einen halbe liter uh, to, uh, of beer to get a half liter or pint of beer. In this case, it would look very similar to the one liter glass Moss Krug, but would simply be a half liter German glass beer mug. If we're going to be anal about glassware, then let's do it right. <laughs> well, you know, I just learned that Stein meant stone in yeah. the last couple of years, right? And I've been assuming that any, you know, German glass German mug was a Stein. So uh, <laughs> I continue to be corrected and I'm sure there will be many more opportunities. Uh, Will knows a lot about this stuff because he lived over there in Germany, right? That's right. That's why he sent this to me. And he even told me on the side, he's like, hey, I emailed you uh, some feedback to the feedback email. You know, so if you want to include it, you can. But I think he makes some good points. Uh, there, There is a colloquial aspect to the way we talk about a lot of things, particularly in beer, in my experience. And I think when we say Stein over here in America, a lot of people just refer to a big beer mug. But yeah, it does mean stone, right? I mean, so I, I don't know what that's supposed to refer to in terms of what you're drinking out of. I mean, do you do, did you learn anything about the glassware called a Stein? I think it just means, yeah, ceramic, uh, you know, beer mug. Yeah, so, so do I, but I'm not even certain about that. Thankfully, Will, I'm not that terribly <laughs> anal about glassware, as, as Jordan, you learned on that episode. So thank you for the, uh, the little glassware lesson there, Will, uh, based on your experience living over in Europe. Uh, I'm just going to keep drinking out of whatever glass is hand to me. All right. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. If you haven't already, please go subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show at YouTube. <laughs> at YouTube.com slash at The Brewlosophy Show. And that is with a regular you, not an umlaut, followed by the at symbol, The Brewlosophy Show. Martin is producing all sorts of fun content, which judging by how rapidly the channel is growing, we're at over 15,000 subscribers already after just a couple of months. I'd say people are really enjoying what he's doing over there. All right, when we're back from this break, our focus will be on post-boil pH adjustment in American IPA. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. I have to imagine that when most brewers are talking about pH, it has to do with either mash or possibly sour beer. You know, mash pH is something that gets a lot of focus. And then, of course, anything that with the word sour in front of it, people are kind of paying attention to the pH of that, but not necessarily boiled wort. However, this has become something that brewers feel is important to focus on. And as you mentioned, Jordan, uh, you know, the bigger commercial breweries are, are constantly, you know, measuring the pH of from start to finish of their beer. So before we break down the specific reasons why people people might be focusing on post-boil uh, pH. I thought it might be a good idea to spend a minute talking uh, a little bit more just about some generals of the pH first. Yeah. So what is pH? Um, basically, it's a quantitative measure of how acidic or basic a liquid solution is. And, you know, anything seven is considered neutral. And uh, the, the scale uh, ranges all the way up to 14, uh, all the way down to, is it one or is it zero, Marshall? 
Oh, good question. I think it's zero. Could be one. I'm not sure. Uh huh. And so close one would be as acidic as you could possibly get. <laughs> or zero. And yeah, that'd be painful. Right, right, right. And, that, you know, definitely scary level of acidity at that point. And then 14 would be as basic as you could possibly get, which I believe is also dangerous, right? They're, both are absolutely dangerous. I believe, I, I forget what the pH of bleach is or chlorine, um, but I don't think it's maximum. I don't think it's 14. And you don't want to get bleach on your skin. Uh, I manage my I manage my own pool. This is a, a total, you know, aside, but kind of an analog. Uh, I do all of my own pool chemicals, and which means that I've got muriatic acid, very, very strong, and I've got, you know, liquid chlorine, which is very strong as well. And you, I mean, you open the lid on those things and they'll knock your socks off. So it is, when we're messing around with pH and pH adjustment, you do have to be somewhat, you know, vigilant with what you're using um, to adjust that, that pH and whatever it is you're adjusting just because it may have some, you know, react with your skin or with your eyesight, uh, or your eyes, stuff like that. So, but, but, but pH in general, like you said, Jordan is just, it's, we use it as a quantitative meaning numbers. Uh, it's measurable measure of how acidic or basic a solution is when something is more acidic. This is, sounds like I'm teaching a, a two-year-old how, <laughs> about this stuff, but if it's more acidic, you perceive that on your tongue is more tart. If it's more basic, it can be kind of flat, uh, and I'm not entirely sure how you would describe a, a non-acidic or a more basic um, solution. Water, my water here at my house is about 8.3 to 8.6. It ranges in terms of uh, the pH. So, it, you know, it, that just tastes like water to me. But um, but yeah, so so that that's the basics of, of pH. But what about pH as it relates to beer? Yeah, I think that most brewers, when they think about pH in beer, are unless we're talking sour beer, of course, yeah. uh, are really focused on the mash. And it's said that 5.2 to 5.6 is really that ideal range. And that has a variety of reasons. Um, and I think, namely, it's ideal for beta amylase, alpha amylase, uh, you know, enzymatic processes that are converting these starches into fermentable sugars. Um, but as you know, you've seen in um, some experiments, right, that maybe there's a bit of wiggle room there. I, you know, it's weird. So we, we've done two experiments specifically focused on the impact of low and high mash pH. Uh, and I forget what the exact numbers are. That's not what this episode is on. But in neither of them uh, were tasters able to reliably tell apart the beers mashed at these different pH levels. But there were some slight, I mean, it wasn't drastic, but there were some slight differences in some of the objective measurements we took that, that would indicate that conversion was different based on the pH of the mash. And if I, again, if I recall correctly, the, the mash that was in between that five, two and five, six, the normal pH mashes did tend to do a little bit better, uh, in terms of, of, you know, post post mash or, or pre boil OG. Um, they, they, but it, I mean, by a couple of specific gravity points, if I recall, it wasn't anything huge or, or something to worry about. And again, uh, you know, nobody could tell these beers apart perceptibly at the end, or it wasn't consistent at least. So, so even that, uh, if, if you're using mash pH as, a, as in your mind, you know, you're thinking that it's having some impact on the flavor or, or the other perceptible characteristics of beer. I'm not entirely sure that's the best reason to, to, to mind it, but I can see value in doing it for some other reasons. Uh, one, one example was the high mash pH, uh, beer, like super high. I think it was somewhere around when, when we mashed and I think I, I adjusted it to around like 6.1 or 6.4, something like that, uh, pH, the, it, it had a much stronger hot break, uh, during the boil. And that's something people might want to pay attention to, you know, because you can drop more particulate out of that work prior to pitching. So pH absolutely has a, a like an observable, measurable impact, at least when we're doing it in the mash. Um, and there are some things that, that brewers do to adjust pH that don't necessarily involve, you know, exogenous, acids, you can use darker malts. There's acid malts. There are, um, you know, uh, sour gut. I believe I'm saying that properly. Uh, and you can use that stuff to adjust the pH down. But then of course there are some other things that you can do to adjust the pH up. Uh, I'm not sure outside of using just pale malt, what you can do other than adding exogenous, uh, you know, chemicals basically. Yeah. And the key there is that in, with most water sources, a pale grist is not going to have, um, the, I don't know, the buffering capacity to reduce the pH into that ideal range. And so in fact, uh, I think my latest short and shoddy article, I did not adjust the water chemistry whatsoever because why not? Let's see what happens. And <laughs> uh, it was a pale pivo, pivo grazitskia. And uh, that's a uh, session smoked uh, 
sour. No, it's not sour. It's a session smoked ale using a hundred percent, uh, the oak smoked wheat malt. Right, right. And the pH was like five, eight or five, nine. <laughs> and so with my water source, I need something to reduce that pH to a better, uh, more inline value. And so that could be one of these uh, exogenous products uh, that you kind of mentioned just there, or even some darker malts. And so yeah. when we make darker beers, like you said, we might be going the opposite direction and need something to kind of like, um, bring it back up because if you have too many dark malts, it could be too low. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's one of the things that I learned, uh, uh, making a, an American stout after I got into, to really paying attention to water chemistry, which as an aside here, you know, I, I remember again, tw- I've been doing this for 20 years. It took me almost 10 years to really start focusing on my water chemistry because I was always told, ah, that's just, that's for the, that's for the nerds. You know, the people who really get into it, you're not really going to notice that big of a difference. It is so easy. Uh, once you, once you learn the language, which is not very difficult, it's so easy to make these adjustments. And it consistently, both anecdotally and in a lot of our experiments, has shown to have a perceptible impact. So do not be afraid of water chemistry. I know that some of the words that we're going to use today and some of the stuff we're talking about sounds huge. It's really not that big of a deal. But uh, if you're brewing a really dark beer, an American stout, a porter, anything with a lot of dark grains, even like a, a you know Schwartz beer or something, uh, you, chances are you may not e- need to make any pH adjustments. Or if you do, depending on your source water, it's usually with something like baking soda. I use pickling lime because you don't really need that much and it doesn't increase the sodium uh, in, in your in your wort or in the, you know that's going into the mash, though we found that, that a little bit of a, a uptick in sodium can actually be beneficial as well. Uh, but there are other things that you can use, right? Um, I think for the most part, when people are adjusting their mash pH, though, they really are focusing mostly on, at least the people that I know, are focusing mostly on bringing that mash pH down into the proper range um, using these exogenous acids and such. And, and there are claims that, hey, you know, if you do this, if you're, if you're in that 5.2 to 5.6 range, I think a lot of people just aim for 5.4 naturally. Uh, if you're there, you're going to taste the difference. It's going to create a, a more you know, zippy, poppy hop note, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to round out the, the malt flavor so that you really get the flavor that the malt's supposed to taste like. I have not experienced that anecdotally, nor in the experiment that I did on high mash pH. I've not experienced that. But if people claim that it does that and it, they think it makes their beer better, then by all means. Again, what we did observe is that by by monitoring that mash pH, you are able to, to, to eke out maybe a few more points in terms of conversion. Uh, if it's worth it for you, then by all means. My question is, you got all that taken care of. You, you've minded the pH of your starting water, the pH of your mash, and now suddenly you boil this wort, you get to the end, and people are saying, now we need to adjust it again. We want to get this, this wort into the proper pH. Let's dig into this because this was, I was like, why, why would you do that? What, what's the concern? You've already adjusted your mash pH when Malcolm was telling me about this a few years ago. What's the purpose? How do you do it? Are you looking for different numbers here and why? <laughs> yeah. And I have to imagine that some of this is stemming from Germanic brewing processes, which are obviously really focused on lager. And I, I believe that the, you know, the Kunzes of the world, et cetera, that are preaching this method, it's probably mostly a fermentation mm-hmm. quality and maybe even industrial process efficiency issue. Um, by lowering the mash pH um, a smidge lower than we were in in the boil relative to going into the fermenter, uh, I think that you can kind of get that pH into the more ideal uh, fermentation pH range uh, ahead of the lag phase uh, of the yeast. And so we're just kind of like making this process a little better for the industrial efficiency, you know, needs at the home level, though, maybe it's not that big of a deal until we started looking at IPA. And there's something very unique that happens with IPA, which is the dry hop, which studies have shown that there is a, uh, you know, observable increase uh, related to dry hops. And so for every additional, you know, pound per barrel of dry hop, you can expect an additional uh, associated increase in pH, which is a function of adding those hops. And so hoppy brewers start to think, well, heck, maybe we should take a, you know, a page from the German brewing book and actually reduce our pH ahead of fermentation to kind of counteract the inevitable rise that we'll see from the dry hop. That is that. So there's a few things about uh, you brought up IPA. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna obviously that's the focus of this episode. I want to I kind of want to dig into to adjusting post boil wort pH in general, anyways. But what 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 
I find really interesting about the fact that adding dry hops increases pH is that when we talk about hops, we talk about alpha acid, alpha acid. <laughs> you would think that at least my my you know silly dense mind would think that by adding hops you'd probably be decreasing the pH because you are throwing in a bunch of alpha acids unisomerized we know that but you're throwing that in. I I would think you know that that would have a have the impact of reducing the pH but what's like you said I've seen the studies as well. It there is consistent findings that by dry hopping you are increasing the pH of uh, of an American IPA or of, of a beer in general, um, and and so yeah, I can understand the kind of hey, w- I wonder what would happen if we if we adjusted the 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 wort the pH of the wort not only to benefit potentially benefit fermentation, but so that when we add dry hops back to it, that pH is where we really wanted it to be in the first place. Uh, I can see that argument. You know, let's give it a shot, and if it has you know some perceptible impact in the end, then all the better, right? Yeah, and so I heard about this method from um, Julian, I forget his last name, the brewer at Beechwood. And Beechwood, you know, makes incredible West Coast IPAs, great sour beers as well. Um, And I'm sure they do a variety of excellent uh, style examples. And when you hear someone like that give, uh, give, you know, preach this uh, gospel, uh, I tend to pay attention. And so (laughs) um, his argument is that uh, it can be kind of flabby if your pH is too high. And that makes sense, right? Like soda is like below three pH, right? That's part of the zip is the uh, proper pH range and IPAs, you know, they need to pop Uh, West Coast IPA. You want that bright, crisp experience. And, you know, we're using crazy levels of dry hop at this point. And we know that the more volume of dry hop you add to a given solution, the greater the pH rise is. So it just makes sense that uh, we could counteract that with something like lactic acid. Yeah, yeah. It's Julian Schrago from, from Beachwood. It's some of the best beer. I mean, I, I, honestly, I think most people have probably heard of Beachwood Brewing. Um, phenomenal beer, phenomenal brewer. And like you said, you take what he says as, as, as being meaningful uh, because of that. So let, let's break down now why somebody would, would, or how somebody would go about adjusting the pH of their wort. First off, we are we're spending a lot of time talking about acids and reducing the pH down in part because American IPA you know you dry hop it it's known to increase the pH would there ever be an instance i i really can't think of one but would there ever be an instance where you might need to add something like pickling lime or, or baking soda to increase the pH of your wort post boil i can't think of any yeah it, only because of the buffering capacity of malt right i mean it's kind of going to it's going to fall in that that ideal range which what is that for post boil wort what are you expecting to see uh, p- you know prior to adjusting the ph what you know you, uh, what what do you expect wort ph to be on its own uh I don't think that it changes a whole heck of a lot from the mash. Um, Now, sparging is going to challenge that a little bit, I think. Um, So uh, especially if you're doing a no sparge brewing a bag batch, I would expect your pH to be fairly similar following the boil. So, um, you know, you're going to be somewhere in that 5.2 to 5.6 range. And if you're sparging, um, you could be uh, maybe on the higher end of that range following the boil. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing with fly sparge brewing, which you just don't hear of many people, at least on the home scale, who are, who are doing a continuous, you know, fly sparge these days. Uh, but yeah, that was a bit, that's a big concern, right? If you over sparge, then it, the, that pH is going to get high enough to extract potential extract tannins uh, from from the wort. So, uh, you know, but I just don't think that's probably an issue. And like you said, very rarely is the wort going to have, I mean, unless you're in extreme conditions maybe, but is the wort going to have a pH that's too low? Um, unless you did a, a sour mash maybe, <laughs> but then you kind of want it to be low, I would imagine, uh, you know, before you're pitching your, your yeast. So, uh, so th- kind of the reason I say that is to qualify the fact that we're probably going to be focusing mostly on acidification of, of the wort post boil for the rest of the episode, uh, because that's, that's usually what is needed, uh, to get that pH back down. So what is it then, wh- what would you say, or what did you read is the ideal pH for the wort to be after the boil, uh, and, and why it would require, you know, a a pH adjustment. Yeah, I think the general rule of thumb is below 5.1. So uh, 5.05, something like that is what you're looking at for German lager brewing. Um, And then I think that for American IPAs, that's where a lot of people are shooting as well. I heard a study on um, the Master Brewers podcast where they said you could go as low as even four because 
with a particularly heavily dry hopped beers because you're going to have, and maybe it was four one, but it was really low because there's going to be such an increase later downstream. You know, there's no reason you can't counteract that far. But I think generally speaking, people are kind of going for like five. Uh, and then the other example is kettle souring is people often go down to like four, five or four, four, uh, just to mitigate any sort of, you know, negative, uh, for, you know, wild spontaneous fermentation or spoiling during the, uh, kettle souring phase before yeast is present. I, I, I think that's something, you know, we didn't hit on it yet uh, until just now, uh, but that's something to be focused on as well is that, you know, I've known uh, when I've known people who are doing, you know, post boil pH adjustment, usually acidification, I mean, almost always acidification. Um, it's, it's really to uh, mitigate the risk of a, you know, a microbe spoilage bacteria getting in there and ruining the beer. Um, because as you get that pH lower, just there are fewer things out there that can, you know, microbes that can, that can get in there and mess things up. I think that's a, that, that in and of itself is kind of a valid reason just to do it, to be on the safe side. But there are those who claim that, like you said, particularly for American IP or hoppier beers, we should say dry hopped beers, that it, it's going to have a perceptible impact on the quality of that hop character in the beer, right? Exactly. And so um, basically, if you want to amplify these like, you know, beautiful, bright hop uh, flavors and, you know, ostensibly malt experiences as well, um, you want to add some acid at the end of the boil. And so, uh, you know, functionally, you know, when you're adding your whirlpool hops, you can add your acid. Uh, I think that lactic acid is probably the most popular. Uh, I've actually heard citric acid can be a really nice uh, post-boil acid choice uh, due to it just kind of has this extra pop to it. Um, you know, citrusy hops, uh, you know, maybe that makes sense. I've used it and I, I've enjoyed it, but I haven't done a side-by-side, -side, so that'd be a good experiment. Uh, and then there's also phosphoric acid. And, you know, you hear debates as to whether uh, one is better than the other for a given style. Uh, you could also use sour gut, and uh, I, I think that we have demonstrated that sour gut does have a flavor uh, when compared to a beer that doesn't have any sour gut in it, in it at all. And so for an IPA, it might be a little weird, um, but it probably could still work. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we've we've seen different acids have seem to have different flavors in a few different experiments, right? Yeah. You know, the, I'm, I'm recalling a conversation again that I had with Malcolm where he swore that he had a batch of 88% lactic acid and which again, by the way, if you're going to do this, if you're going to, if you're going to do any sort of water pH adjustments at all uh, in your brew house, uh, I would highly recommend getting the strongest acid available to you uh, that won't kill you, of course, <laughs> that's made for brewers, uh, which is 88% lactic acid for a lot of us. And I believe you can get, I don't know where to find the, the stronger phosphoric acid. Usually like at more beer, it's like 10% phosphoric. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used that as well. You're going to have to use quite a bit more to achieve the same pH reduction as you would with a stronger acid, of course. Both work fine. But I recall Malcolm swearing that he had a batch of lactic acid that smelled like diacetyl, that had that, that, had that buttery smell to it. I have lactic in my in my brewery now that I've had out there for got 2 years I think and it does not smell like butter at all. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I would not want to be adding a buttery flavorant to to my beer. Um, but for the most part, I've heard a lot of good things about citric acid. I've never bought the stuff, never used it, but I I would be hesitant to think that it that it actually has a flavor impact uh, because of the source of the acid, the citric part of it. Uh, but maybe it does. And I like you said, I think that's a good place for an experiment to compare them. Uh, but really the idea here is that you're adding an acid to get that pH I'm just going to say down around five, uh, below five one, as you said, Jordan, so that in the end, not only are you contributing to, the, to beneficial fermentation ostensibly, but you are also hopefully making it so that when you add those dry hops, the pH doesn't come up high enough to create a, quote, flabby beer, which we have all made dry hopped beers where you're drinking it going, I wasted so much money on this and it does not taste as sharp and as crisp as I expected in the end, right? Yeah, and I'm sure that the same could be said for hazy IPA too. Totally. You know, uh, you do not want a flabby hazy. Uh, it's obviously uh, can be have a fire, higher finishing gravity, lower bitterness. But if that was flabby on top of that, that's going to be gross. <laughs> the word flabby cracks me up. <laughs> it just feels wrong, but I whatever. I get it. Uh, so I've never done this. I've never that I I have. <laughs> I have adjusted the pH of my finished beer in the glass just for experimental purposes, for fun, sitting around with friends, seeing if you could turn like an American IPA into a sour beer using lactic acid, whatever. But I have never like intentionally 
uh, adjusted down the pH of my wort prior to pitching yeast. You've done this more than just for the experiment, right? Oh, I do it every batch. So what, anecdotally speaking, we're going to talk about the experiment here in a minute, but prior to, to doing the experiment, did your experience in doing this method align with expectations? Is it, obviously, you kept doing it, so it had something. It, I mean, it, it, was, it reinforced your reason for doing it. Yeah, you know, I'm always chasing uh, how to perfect uh, certain styles, American IPA being one of them. And I was making pretty good American IPA, and I heard about this. It just made sense, and it's... Very easy to add, you know, four milliliters of lactic acid at, at flame out. Yeah. And so I tried it and it seemed like the beer was good. And I've been making, in my opinion, and I guess I've been winning awards too, but really good American IPA. And uh, it's one of those things that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's, and so I don't know if this necessarily fixed anything, but it's, I was making good IPAs with the method. So, um, you know, I think that an experiment was an appropriate next step to figure out if it's actually making any difference. Absolutely. And, and like you said, sometimes there are things that we do out of ritual. Uh, sometimes there are things that we do that don't necessarily have uh, empirical backing to them, but it's easy enough. And our anecdotal experience in the end, like I said, it reinforces us doing it because it's so simple and cheap. This to me seems like one of those, but I, I feel like once you get the experiment done, it's like, all right, let's just see how close, you know, or how much my mind was at play here if there was an actual impact. When we come back from this break, we're going to be going over that experiment where you looked at the impact post-boil acidification has on an American IPA. We'll be right back. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. For people who have no experience, brewing can seem like a really convoluted process, but really it's, it's pretty simple. That is until you start getting into the weeds with seemingly esoteric methods that promise to positively impact beer quality. Admittedly, that's how I viewed post-boil pH adjustments for a while, though if it has a positive impact or at least the, the impact that some claim it does, it may very well be worth the effort. Jordan, you performed an experiment to see for yourself. I did. So I brewed a single batch of American IPA, which you know I think at this point, West Coast IPA, American IPA, we'll figure out what we're going to call it at some point. But um, And the recipe was really inspired by Society the Pupil, a fantastic Nelson Forward American IPA out of San Diego. Love that beer, especially so on draft at the brewery. And so this is 75% Pilsner malt, 20% wheat malt, and 5% Carahel. So we mashed that grist at 148 Fahrenheit or 65 C for 60 minutes for a single infusion mash. Uh, that was a no sparge batch uh, and then laudered to collect that sweet wort. That wort was then boiled for 60 minutes. I used a five milliliter hop shot at 60 minutes, 17 grams of Nelson and 11 grams of Strata at 20 minutes. 
and 71 grams of Nelson, 28 grams of Strata, and 25 grams of Centennial for a 10-minute whirlpool that I add directly at flame out as soon as I kill the uh, flame. Yeah, that that sounds like an awesome hot bill. I'm I'm one of those who has a kind of a love-hate relationship with Nelson Savin, uh, we, which most people just call Nelson nowadays. Uh, I've, I've made a single hop Nelson beer where I was like, okay, that tastes more like wine than it does beer, which I like wine, but I don't want to mix with my beer. But when you blend it in with some of these other hops, particularly in my opinion, I think it works so well with Cascade and Centennial. Man, it can really, really make that pop. My question for you, and I know a lot of people are probably wondering this as well. What's your experience like with these hop shots? How do you know like how much to use? To uh, You're using it primarily for bitterness, I imagine. Yeah, they're a blessing and a curse, man. They are so difficult to deal with. I like last time I used them, they were like exploding all over me and it's a sticky goo uh, and you have to get them They're They're, you know, you store them cold. So they're frozen. And so you have to use like d- throw the hop shot in boiling water to liquefy it. But then you have to try to, you know, you're getting out a speck Ugh. for a crazy amount of bitterness. So like getting the right amount, it's really challenging. And then you have to like blend it with like ethanol or something so that it actually can go into solution. <laughs> so they may be too, more trouble than they're worth, but Sounds like it. <laughs> it's, it's in my continuing quest of like picking up bits of uh, lore from amazing West coast IPA brewers. Yeah. Uh, I heard that these hop shots create a really clean bitterness. That's just way cleaner than anything you can get from a pellet or whole cone variety. And, I like that dry, clean, uh, kind of San Diego style IPA. And so it just seems like, why not? And uh, so I, that is definitely nothing we'll need to test out and experiment. Yeah, that, that's it. Your experience aligns with everything that I've heard about hop shots. It's particularly that when you add them to, to, to boiling wort, it doesn't dissolve. So you have to figure out a way to like pre-blend it so that it actually gets into solution. So, well, thanks for sharing that with us. I've never used hop shots. It do, almost does sound like using um, extract where it's like, okay, I get to save 45 minutes, but I have to clean up this huge sticky mess. <laughs> it's not my thing. So. And I always forget about it. Oh crap, the word's boiling oh god okay get some water boiling and so it's it, it always causes problems but yeah. um i love this hot bill um you know i i agree that 100 percent nelson i mean i'm down but i could see how uh it's a bit one note and so i found that um this kind of four to one ratio of uh, a new zealand variety a kind of modern sexy american variety like strata citra yeah and then um the the four to one ratio uh, and then one is some sort of classic c hop uh collectively there's a great gestalt there that kind of gets you everything you want from new world uh new american varieties and then kind of old school ipa hops that just really collectively make a fantastic west coast ipa hopping approach i love it man good yeah good good choice there so following that boil uh we chilled that wort down um and i split this is a single uh batch because i uh had yet to have uh side-by-side systems yet so i put identical volumes of wort into two separate sanitized fermenters. And so uh, this is where the variable comes in. And I'm actually adding two milliliters of 88% lactic acid into one of those as I'm running off to reduce that uh, target to about five pH, uh, which was confirmed with a pH meter. Uh, ultimately, you know, we have same FG, I'm sorry, OGs, because this is the same batch. Yeah. Uh, we were at 1060. Um, and prior to adding that pH adjustment to half, uh, we we're at 5.28 wort pH. Yeah. So that is exactly what you said, right? That is, that is 5.2 to 5.6 is, is the mash pH that you did aim for. And you did adjust your mash pH to, to ensure it was within that range. Um, and so now you've got this wort at the end of the boil that's 5.2. Uh, pH right around five three pH um, again right where you would expect your mash pH to be so that's all in line uh, and so then you add two milliliters of eighty eight percent lactic acid two milliliters folks is not very much at all <laughs> that's but it is powerful stuff and it did reduce that one half of the wort down to about five point zero pH is that what it was correct so uh, now that the half has been acidified and the other half is just kind of that's 528. Uh, I split a starter of Imperial Yeast AO7 flagship evenly between the two and uh, the beers were left to ferment at 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 C for a couple days uh, at which point I began to slowly raise the temperature up to 68 F or 20 C. Um, so after a while, we uh, decided to see uh, if these beers were, you know, done fermenting for that first stage prior to the dry hop. And so might as well check the uh, pH while we're at it. This blew me away. The adjusted batch was at 3.99. Okay. The unadjusted beer was at 4.0. 
That, so that is really, really interesting to me. And it really, it, it supports what I've heard a lot of about fermentation being an incredibly powerful thing uh, when it comes to bringing things together. Uh, the, it's not the yeast per se, but it is the act of fermentation and what those yeast are doing in that wort. These were essentially the same pH at, at, after fermentation. Um, did the lower pH actually help with fermentation? It, it, it doesn't, I mean, you, based on the pH at the end of fermentation, it wouldn't necessarily seem like it, but this is really fascinating to me. Yeah, and I didn't have a tilt in like both of them and monitor uh, let alone um, uh, something that could read pH constantly. Uh -huh. So I would not be surprised if the adjusted batch did ferment out six hours earlier yeah. or something like yeah. that. Um, but by the time you know we came back to actually proceed to dry hopping, uh, they were pretty darn similar. Well, and I'll tell you, you know, this result alone, this very, this is objectively measured with a, you know, a reliable pH meter. Um, you know, there, there was no, we're not thinking that there was an accident going on here. This on its own would make me think, all right, we're not going to taste a difference. <laughs> there, you know, two milliliters of lactic acid. That's not really that much anyways, in, you know, in, a, in however many gallon batch. Uh, and now, you know, post fermentation, they're basically at the same pH. I, at this point, I'd be going, all right, these are probably going to taste exactly the same. That, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but then again, maybe there's something that's not just pH, but yeah. it's like magic, right? And that even <laughs> though they look the same in terms of numbers, there's a, f a flavor difference there. But uh, lest we not get ahead of ourselves. So next was dry hopping. And uh, I dry hopped it with 85 grams of Nelson, 28 grams of Centennial, and 28 grams of Strata. Um, and so after a day on the dry hops, I uh, took a hydrometer measurement and did see that there was a, uh, a an FG difference. The adjusted batch was 10.08. FG and the unadjusted batch was 1010. So again, you know, 1008, 1010, not huge. <laughs> Nothing that would make me really blink an eye, I guess as it were. Uh, but but there is a difference, and that is something to kind of log away is okay, now you've got basically the same post-fermentation pH, but the batch that had that post-boil fermentation or that, that post-boil pH adjustment did seem to attenuate a little bit more. Um, and maybe that does speak to uh, there being a, an actual impact. Well, and I like dry beer, and that's my intention here. So absolutely, uh, and I, yeah. And and you know, the one that we recently published, it you, it's pretty much the same, but there is a, it maybe it's just measurement error, but there is a small difference too, uh, in terms of the adjusted versus the unadjusted, and that was in a lager format. So it seems that the acidification uh, following the boil does have some sort of uh, small but meaningful impact on attenuation. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I, so do I. And and one of the things I, I always, whenever we talk about attenuation is, as um, having some sort of a perceptible impact so that the what your finishing gravity is, uh, I, I cannot help but go to our mash temperature experiments where very consistently we've been able to show that beers that finish almost 10 specific gravity points apart are not perceptibly, uh, that you can't, people can't distinguish them based on that, which in those experiments, albeit you know, all we're doing is changing the mash temperature, but there's been this widely held belief that the higher the FG is, the more sweet the beer is going to be, which, which is a makes sense on a very basic level. But what we've come to find out, and there's actually research out there that, that, that supports this is that the long chain dextrins that remain in wort based on mash temperature don't seem to have that perceptible sweetness that a lot of people presume that they do. But in this case, I do wonder this was not a mash temperature thing this was something else is at play you know and it's only again it's only a two specific gravity point difference here on the fg but something else is at play these, these were from the same mash these you know so maybe there is a perceptible difference because that fg difference was caused by something else other than mash temperature yeah and even if there isn't a perceptible difference it's a lever that we're continuing to demonstrate works yeah is that acidification at uh, the fall in the boil can reduce your p uh, your fg a little bit more. I will say, who knows if you gave the unadjusted batch another week if it would catch up. And so maybe it's just a fermentation speed and we're just, you know, not waiting a month to make sure that it's finally going to attenuate with you know, next to its brother. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. And so who knows? But nonetheless, there was another important difference here, uh, which is that there was, we found, we took a pH measurement and voila, there's a little difference. The adjusted batch was 4.1 
So we saw a, a effectively a 0.1 increase uh, via the dry hop in the pH yep. versus the unadjusted was 4.2. And so, although they started basically the same going into the dry hop, it's like it had increased buffering capacity or something, uh, thanks to that knockout lactic acid yeah. that was able to uh, counteract uh, or mitigate some of the pH rise associated with the dry hop. Yeah, and and you know the, the way my brain works when I think about this kind of stuff is on their own, all of those things kind of feel like eh, not a big deal. But as you start to put the sandwich together, you start to see that things are different. There does seem to be some effect of this post-boil acidification uh, at play here, and maybe it will have a perceptible impact. But at the very least, we can say it did seem to have you know an effect on the FG and on attenuation. It, it, be it I'll be it you know relatively small but uh, it did there so interesting stuff yeah and notably i think the rule of thumb is you don't want your finished ph to be above four or five and both of these are below that so at that point you know maybe this isn't even a necessary practice given my mass ph or gris or water you know natural water chemistry who knows so i think uh, now it's up to give it to some tasters and see if anyone can actually tell a difference that's right so and and like you always do you pressure transfer these beers to co2 purge kegs you don't want any oxidation in there you are a good brewer the, you know these are the things that we do to ensure our beers uh, stay stay as good as we hope that they they are in the first place um, but yeah so before we talk about the the blind taster data I want to talk a little bit about your experience with these. And the first thing is in terms of appearance. I'm looking at the photos right now on the website, on the article, and these beers look different. Was that a function of condensation or were these beers visibly, you know, did they have different appearance? Another thing that absolutely blew me away in terms of the objective differences, the acidified one cleared better. I did, I do not uh, gelatin find these, uh, but you know, with some time, uh, in the in the cold keg, as well as like all my other practices for trying to make, get clear beer as possible uh, prior, uh, de you know, pre-stream, uh, we saw a very big difference. The one that was unadjusted was a little hazier. It noticeably hazier, it, just based on the photos. I mean, I, I was really shocked by that. Uh, what it, what I find really curious, uh, <laughs> this is where we start to like go back to other experiments and experiences, is that like I mentioned earlier, the uh, when I did the high mash pH experiment many years ago uh, that if I recall correctly, that wort that was the high mash pH actually had a stronger hot break and the wort ended up being clearer in the fermenter because it was easier to leave behind that troube. Um, the fact that the the lower pH beer post, I guess, post boil adjusted, you know, beer um, was clearer. It, again, I start to get confused. Like, where is this clarity coming from? What impacts clarity all, all on its own in the first place? Um, but yeah, really interesting observation here. And, it, and it's really noticeable. If you go to the article and you look at it, you're going to see that the acidified, you know, post-boil acidified beer it, is clearer. Yeah, and, and the other one, it's like kind of homebrew clear-ish. You know, it's not like it was a murky, hazy mess, but there is a very obvious difference. Go to the uh, website and check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you did five triangle tests on your own. Of course, these are not blind triangles. We refer to them as semi-blind because we we don't know what beer is in what glasses and what cups, uh, but we do try to our, our best to kind of suspend bias and see if we can distinguish these beers. Uh, how well did you do on this one? I got it five out of five times. And, <laughs> so, that's crazy. you know, it was the difference was stark and it was it was really both were great just in their own ways. Um, and so one the one that was acidified following the boil it just had this like brighter hop flavor and that's what we said was the whole purpose right was to have yeah. a brighter pop and it really seemed to work and and I don't know if I'm right on this, but I swear that it really amplified the centennial character. Like it almost had this like fresh hop beer flavor um, where the unadjusted batch was more, quote, even. And so it was not bad. Um, and I had a slight preference for the adjusted batch, um, but really both were great. And so, again, the pHs on both were still below four or five. So we were below the danger zone. So um, yeah. at the very least, it seems that it's a lever to kind of help certain uh, at least maybe certain varieties pop. 
Yeah, and I think you I think you'll agree with me on this that oftentimes, you know, confirmation bias is an incredibly powerful thing. So, if we're employing a specific method, expecting it to do one thing, it's not surprising if when it has an impact, we perceive it as doing the thing we expected, and that is why we serve these beers to blind tasters and don't tell them what the variable is. I mean, we've gone back and forth on whether or not we should inform tasters of the variable prior. That would go completely against, you know, industry standard for sensory evaluation, but um, but we do serve these beers to tasters who have no clue what was going on. At the very least, we give them the style just because some people ask, and I, I guess that's not really a part of uh, the experiment. But in this case, you served it to 18 participants, out of which 10 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us to say with some degree of confidence that there is a, a distinguishable difference between these beers. And in the end, how many chose the odd beer out? We got 10, uh, which is a significant difference. And so we are able to say with some degree of confidence that tasters could reliably tell beers apart where one was adjusted pH following the boil and the other was not. That's wild to me. Now, we don't ask the question at the end of these, uh, the triangle test surveys, we don't ask them, well, what was it that was different about them? Uh, we've tried that. It is an absolute mess. And there's really, <laughs> there, there's very rarely uh, ever any uh, congruence on what people say. It's, it's usually different. But the fact that this many people over what you would expect by random guessing, um, you know, would be able to to tell the beers apart, I, it does. Again, like I said, it doesn't. Work. This isn't a surefire thing. Oh, you gotta go and adjust your 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 post boil work pH now. Uh, but it does seem to suggest that it had some impact, which I find absolutely fascinating. Particularly because when whenever we do an experiment with an American IPA naturally very hoppy, especially the way you brew them, uh, you know, Jordan, uh, when you're doing that, a lot of, if it comes back non-significant, people are like, well, you got to try it with a, a, a less, you know, aggressively hoppy beer because those hops just got in the way and covered it up. Well, in this case, uh, you know, this goes to show that even those really hoppy beers uh, can be impacted by variables as little as two milli- two milliliters of lactic acid being added post boil. That is absolutely fascinating to me. It's mind blowing. But again, you know, I said they were both good. And so we actually asked those that got the question, the, the, the odd beer out right, what did they prefer? Yeah. And it was evenly split. Five of the 10 that got it right preferred adjusted, and five preferred the unadjusted batch. I mean, t- it was honestly like they were two different beers almost. Like, what, you know, Pliny versus Blind Pig, both great beers, but different. And Half of beer Rush River fans might prefer Pliny and half might prefer Blind Pig. There's no wrong answer here. And so that's what really blew me away is they really did taste and probably smell different, um, but not necessarily one was like, wow, this one's so good and this one's garbage. It was more like, <laughs> you know, different strokes for different folks. And I could probably uh, every other day change my mind as to, in terms of which one I like better. Yeah, you know, I say this every time we talk about this preference thing on a, on an ex- a significant experiment. It, so preference is wholly subjective. Yeah, I mean, if you serve somebody, uh, you know, rotten eggs in a glass versus, you know, a delicious IPA, I have a feeling that the... <laughs> Maybe all people are going to like the beer more than the rotten eggs. But when in terms of things that, that where the delta isn't that huge, uh, y- y- you're going to get people who prefer one thing over the other. I hate it when people ask me, yeah, okay, but which one did people like more? Well, that's split, you know, and this proves it yet again <laughs> that people like different things. And the implication there is that you have to try this out for yourself to determine if it's something that you want to do in your brewery, uh, if you even perceive it, uh, an effect from it on your own. Maybe you don't. And when you're brewing you know, a five-gallon batch in your garage, you're doing what you think is best for you, unless you're competing, of course. So do that. You know that That's the thing. Uh, ultimately, in the end, what these results tell us is that acidification of your post-boil wort with lactic acid, at least, 88% lactic acid, may very well have a perceptible impact on an American IPA, which is fascinating because of how hoppy these beers are. Is it something that you're going to continue doing, Jordan, as somebody who's done it so many times before? Absolutely, I will. Um, And I think that at the very least, it's insurance, right? Yeah. If we were to have a really dramatic pH increase thanks to a dry hop, which could be hop or hop variety or hop format dependent, by the way, you know, whole cone versus pellet versus sots versus cascade, who knows? Uh, It's just nice to know that you've kind of done the work on the front end to mitigate the risk down line for a flabby beer. But as we saw measurably, even the unadjusted batch in this 
you know, particular batch and my particular process and my home with my water, my grist, et cetera, it still was below that threshold that we don't want to be above. So it seems that maybe it's not absolutely necessary for every batch, but, you know, two milliliters, uh, you know, scaling it up, maybe four in a larger batch. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. And it's so cheap. I mean, lactic acid is one of those things where you're like, God, I didn't realize I can get away with buying this stuff for so cheap. Um, and honestly, like you said, it's easy enough to do. So if you're finding that your IPA isn't poppy enough, or if you, if you feel like, you know, after a big dry hop, you're kind of getting that this thing that we refer to as flabby, give it a shot. It's super duper easy. What would you say about, um, you know, maybe diluting down some 88% lactic and trying it in a glass of beer? Um, I, w- I would imagine at two milliliters for a full batch, I would imagine that, that diluting it down enough might be kind of difficult, but it could give somebody an idea, you know, if, if uh, adjusting their, their work post boil might actually have the impact they're looking for. Yeah, you certainly could. And another thing to remember is you can always do this following the dry hop as well. And I know that uh, um, Beechwood, they will double check to make sure that they don't need to and will adjust as necessary to make sure that that finished beer is below four or five. So it ain't too late following the dry hop, but, you know, mitigating oxygen exposure and just being done with the process. Yeah, um, it's a heck of a lot easier to just add it at flame out. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more because especially on our scale, right? Uh, We know most of us aren't brewing on on uh, fermenters that have, you you know, no oxygen ways of ports for like getting extra stuff in there. And so being able to adjust it prior to even pitching your yeast and having very little worry about, you know, uh, cold side oxidation, I think is a smart move. So, well, we do have a couple of reader comments to get to. The first one comes from Kurt, who says, do you think the higher attenuation of the adjusted beer impacted your preference or is it all down to the pH? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, Maybe so, maybe not. Uh, I do think that I like drier beer, um, but I don't recall that being what I was really like detecting is the difference and it was like dryness yeah um certainly there's an interactive effect here but really it was just this like more vibrant uh hop character in the adjusted batch it didn't seem to be too much of an effect of dryness or attenuation yeah i i would i will go on record saying that i doubt there are any people out there who could detect a two specific gravity point difference in FG uh, from beers that started at the same OG. I mean, that is just so incredibly small. And and, and I would be very confident in saying that it, it's not sweet. There's not a difference in sweetness or dryness. So my hunch is that what you perceived was a genuine impact of the variable, which in this case seemed to allow that hop character to come out in a different way, qualitatively speaking. Um, and, and that's the neat thing about this experiment is it kind of showed that it can do that. So uh, final comment comes from uh, Stephen Ousts, who says the clarity difference is astounding. I agree, Stephen. Uh, Thank you for performing this experiment. I've been curious about acidifying my work for a while now, and I think I'll add two milliliters of lactic acid to my IPA that's currently fermenting. Well, I wonder how that turned out, Stephen. Yeah, and we learned a lot of things from this, right? That it uh, appears to impact both uh, the final pH as well as the clarity, as well as the attenuation. And so, you know, in... a lot of once you get really deep in the rabbit hole that is brewing, we're really just fine tuning things, yeah, right? And yeah. it's trying to go from that A minus to an A or, or or something like that, right? And I think that this experiment demonstrates that if you want a, just a little extra something, it's really easy and it seems to have some sort of an impact. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself. I mean, this this is one of those things that I did not expect to come back significant. And when it did, I was like, dang, that, that's fascinating. So, well, that is all the time we've got for this episode. Do you have any final comments, Jordan? It's easier than you think. Just add a little bit of lactic acid or experiment with other acids at the end of the boil and um, maybe you'll be making clearer, drier, and hoppier beer. Yeah, yeah couldn't agree more. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, we got a lot of questions after this uh, this article published about you know how did you, what did you use a calculator to adjust it, all of that stuff. If you go to the article on the website, you can read some of Jordan's comments on that. We didn't want to get too much into it because that's more of a lesson than it is anything else. But I think like you said, Jordan, you could probably do some guesswork, two to three milliliters for a five gallon batch, see where you end up. If you, if you feel like it needs a little bit more, add a little bit more, it's not going to hurt anything. So, well, don't forget to subscribe to the brew lab podcast where brew is Kate Job and occasionally Jordan folks take you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode.
The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no.